Asia is the distant and isolated part of the world, geographically the most distant in the world, separated from all other landmasses. A little known fact is that the concepts and methods of fighting originating from there were very unique and due to the overall culture in the region were very brutal in their nature. New Zealand Martial Arts The natives of New Zealand, the Maori, were of a warlike caste system and culture. Fighting was valued, and the battlefield was a test of triumph and to remind yourself that you were alive. Combat was and still is a method of expression. With this in mind, the Maori method of fighting is actually quite remarkable and similar to the same methods that evolved in China, Korea, Okinawa, and Japan in relation to martial arts. Training is also similar with the concept of maraku, which is Maori for roughly to bear a weapon, which can also be extended to wielding a weapon, having experience with a weapon, or being skilled in combat. The term maraku is a generic term referring to or describing in part or completely the use or implementation of weapons taught in the Wairtu Tua, which is a Maori of saying the house of war, where young warriors being Toa in New Zealand were educated in the various aspects of combat. Many practitioners of Maraku would spend their whole lives refining their skills as well as their bodies to help implement these methods. As in other martial arts, the concept of fighting is for life, and in New Zealand, it's no different than anywhere else. In terms of weapons, there are a wide range that the Maori once used and still use today. Maori weapons. The ma taia is a term that refers to the use of the taia alone, which is a close-range staff weapon which was originally made from wood or whalebone and used for short, quick, or sharp strikes or stabbing motions with quick footwork from the wielder, 1.5 to 1.8 meters or 5 to 6 feet long. The components of the weapon are the ao, which is called tongue, used for the stabbing and parrying as mentioned, the opoko, the head, from which the tongue can extend, and the ate, or liver alternatively called the tiana, or body. The long flop blade, which can be also used for striking and powering. In modern times, the taia is used in many examples to introduce people to the Maori culture. And training with the weapon is seen as a method of welcoming into the Maori way of life and or way of thought in relation to combative situations. The weapon is such of significance historically of pre-European contact in New Zealand, it's actually on the national coat of arms which portrays a warrior with a taia and on the official badge of New Zealand where a taia has been crossed with a sword, replacing the original two-sword colonial motif, the poenua. These are in older cases elaborately carved staff-like weapons similar to totem poles and other standing sculptures that connects the people, called the Tangata, with the Wenua, called the Land, with their ancestral past. Much of the reputation of a tribal group would rest with the Poenua, which evolved similarly to the form of certain Japanese weapons, which came from everyday objects that changed to suit a more weapon-like purpose. Accounts from the Maori have said that a well-timed, strong blow from this weapon could result in a quick death of an adversary the hoeroa. This is a mysterious club-like weapon that could vary in terms of length, but sometimes be the same measurements as the taia, and were made from the lower jawbone of sperm whales. Accounts mention that the hoeroa were precious heirlooms and usually belonged to high-ranking men, and personally representing their mana, or chiefly authority, or even life essence. Techniques and methods of using the Hoi Roa have been lost, but hypothesis suggested that they might have been used as striking or stabbing weapons or even thrown as projectiles. The Patu A well-known weapon of the Maori outside of New Zealand, Patu means to strike, hit, beat, or subdue. It's basically a generic term for a club or pounding device. When used as a weapon, the patu was a short-handled, hand-striking weapon of close range used in pre-colonial times, mostly during inter-tribal conflict. 
The Batu, regardless of what they were made of, were often decorated with elaborate carving designs. The Mede. Arguably the most well-known Maori weapon, the Mede is a traditional short, broad-bladed club, much like the Batu, usually between the range of 25 to 50 centimeters or 10 to 20 inches in length. 7 to 12 centimeters or 3 to 5 inches in width, usually crafted from jade or ponamu. Though at times the dimensions of the weapon were often determined by the nature of the material that the mede was made from. Geographical distances and locations in New Zealand harder than in some parts of the country of mede made from ponamu were called mede, while in other areas the term is used in a more broad context to describe batu made from whalebone, batu paeroa, or kauri, and other types of hardwoods. Mere raku, or mere mere, or even stone, mere onewa. Patu, or mere, made from ponamu, were called patu ponamu, or mere ponamu, to separate those made from others with different materials. The said hardness of the ponamu that weapons made from this type of stone could be honed thinner than others, but the hardness of the stone also meant that sometimes the completion of the work could take up to two generations. The weapon was primarily used in close combat, but also served as a status symbol of chieftainship and warrior rank, and the said weapon was sometimes passed down through the generations, ceremoniously named and acknowledged as having its own spirituality, magical attributes, and mana. Mede were gripped and held in one hand, used mainly for thrusting or jabbing at the ribs, neck, or side of the head, where combined with the so-called flick of the wrist, a well-placed strike to an opponent's skull could be cracked easily, according to some records. While other clubs in Polynesia tended to administer a downward blow to the head, the stabbing and thrusting of the mede makes it unique only to the Maori. Of all the varieties of mede, the mede ponamu were the hardest and least likely to break, therefore logically the most valued. When not in use, they were often hidden to avoid theft or being stolen. In carved treasure boxes called the wakahua, it was often an honor to be killed by a notable mede, and prisoners would sometimes ask to be executed by their own weapon, rather than by a lesser status one. Receiving a mere ponamu as a gift was and still is a sign and mark of good faith. Kotiate and Wahaika Different types of clubs as mentioned in similes and origin from the Patu and Mere, these take on a different shape from the previous examples. The Kotiate is named after the shape of the liver, Koti, meaning to slice in two, and Ate meaning the liver. It's a variety of short club usually constructed of whale bone or wood. Wahaika means the mouth of the fish and is again a short club made of whalebone or wood, but is unique in the fact that it has a notch on one of the sides that could be possibly used to catch an opponent's weapon strike. As with the more conventional patu, the wahaika is used in close quarter combat, hand-to-hand -hand situations, and as a thrusting or striking weapon. Tewahatewa. These are also ox-shaped, but for most examples in relation to this weapon, they are more resembling of a long-handled club. Once commonly used in battle, but are now limited in use and practicality to ceremonial occasions. As with longer weapons like the Poenua and Teaha, this weapon was developed for sparring using rapid strikes and thrusts, supported by quick movement from the wielder. The blows from the weapon were not stricken, with the blade as anyone would expect with an ox, but rather the thicker straight front edge. It was common for the Tewahata to be decorated with feathers which hung from a carved hole near the lower edge of the blade. This said decoration might have also had the added benefit of distracting or confusing the wielder's opponent. The Tewaha and Taia are used in similar ways to the Asian bow staff, as the weapon can be used in both an offense and defensive method. Combat Training and Techniques According to an ancient Maori proverb, training in general for offensive and defensive ways should be taught, quote-unquote, from the feet up. Formal taiaha footwork are based 
in part on a complex dance-like step called kado, evasion, with many variations named for the characteristics and auctions of different animals. Example is the tutara, lizard, patterns following slow, crouching steps in contrast with the light and active footwork of the tui, bird. Conditions for combat adjusting depending on the environment the confrontation traditionally took place in. Certain movements are for soft penetrative standings required when fighting on sand or when in knee-deep water, or careful slow movements when standing upon rocky or dangerous terrain for the foot. Maori tradition dictates that basic combat training should begin early in life. But before the colonial era in New Zealand, it was common for boys to be dedicated at birth to the odds and taught games from early childhood that would prepare them for their adult lives as warriors. The introductory training or initial aspects of training came from tirakao, or stick games. These were contests of skill in manipulating, throwing, catching, or dodging short dots and staffs. Eventually, once the student has developed to the appropriate hand-eye coordination and skill, he would be introduced to sparring exercises and other more combat-oriented games. But before being allowed to handle an actual tayaha, or weapon, youths would practice their guard and thrusting techniques with lightweight flock stems called toy toy, which is a native New Zealand plant somewhat similar to bamboo in terms of strength and adaptability. In some tribes, as a tradition of initiation or ritual test, as a boy would have a chance to learn some more advanced techniques of his tribal fighting styles. A senior or more skilled fighter would take a single free strike at the novice boy. If he were able to parry, block, or avoid the attack, he would be admitted into the warrior's house for more intensive training. If he failed to defend himself, he would have to wait and continue honing his skills. Another aspect of Dayoha instruction includes the ability to read the opponent's intentions by studying his movement. Maori fighters traditionally dueled and fought on the battlefield without any form of armor. Experts were able to tell differences between a feint and a committed attack by nothing but where the big toe of their enemy's foot clenched on the or to the ground as they prepare their attack, and were also able to anticipate attacks by watching the flexing of certain muscles. In modern post-colonial times, techniques and applications of the said arts still form the basic level of weapons training with the Taioha and other weapons. Hawaiian Martial Arts much like the Maori, the native Hawaiians also had their own concepts of what being a warrior is. A caste system was introduced to the Hawaiian Islands by Tahitian colonists whom arrived in the 1300s. But the concept of fighting and arts related to it arguably existed since humans first inhabited the islands. The Hawaiian martial art has had many names but can be known as Kapu Kuialua or in modern times just as Lua. The art is based on bone breaking, joint locks, throws, pressure point manipulation, weapon usage, strategy, and oceanic warfare. The term or name Kuya Lua can be interpreted as meaning two hits. Originally, those associated with the nobility or of high status were taught these arts. In times of war, commoners were instructed in basic aspects of the martial art techniques. An interesting fact is that experienced practitioners in the art could coat themselves in a thin layer of coconut oil and usually removed all of their body hair in order to slip away from holes or grips, or essentially avoid being grappled during battle. The word for Lua masters is Oloe, which means hairless. However, much like Maori martial laws of all kinds, after Europeans reached their home islands, the arts and much of their original form were forgotten or altered because of the foreign colonialness. King Kamehameha I actually did something that the Maori did not do. He actually created public schools to teach the arts so they would not be fully forgotten. Some aspects of Lua were incorporated into the Hawaiian-based Danzan Ryu Karate, developed in the 1920s. Hawaiian Weapons one weapon used by many Polynesian peoples, but notably the Hawaiians, is the Le O Mano, which is essentially a club that is lined with shark teeth for cutting, stabbing, and slicing. The word Le O Mano are actually words within the Hawaiian language, and might come from a separate word, Le O Mano, 
which can translate as a shock slave. Known for use as a traveling tool as well as a weapon by the Hawaiians, the flat part of the oar was used to protect and shield the warrior's face and body, and even from objects thrown at them. Kue kue le o mano. Much like the standard le o mano, this is a variant that has some origins either as an oar or part of one. The flat part of the pata was used to protect the shield and the warrior's face and body from objects being thrown. The curved part was used like an ox to cut and shred. Kuekue lima le o mano. Much like the other variants, but it was curved to allow easier use during battle. Accounts had it that older fighters would use such a weapon such as this because it was lighter in weight. Le o mano variants. There have been countless variants of the le o mano as it would often vary depending on the situation that the warrior found themselves in and the physical ability of the fighter. Known for use as a traveling tool within Polynesia, as well as a weapon by the Hawaiians, the flat part of the oar was used to protect and shield the warrior's face and body, and even from objects thrown at them. The blade was used as a sort of blunt axe weapon or even sword to chop or cut their opponents. The Honda was used to fight as a staff. In some respects, the oar is viewed as a multi-use weapon, iwe, meaning bone or bone from the human. In the most ancient accounts, actual bones of deceased men or warriors were used as weapons. Thigh bones, shoulder blades, hip bones, collar bones, forearm bones, and rib bones were once used as spears and or knives. Ka'ane, the strangling cord. This was a weapon used in different forms of combat, from blocking to grabbing, catching, flipping or whipping, even strangling or choking. The cord could be made or comprised of almost any sort of fiber or material. Ko'oko'o, bokale, short staff. Short staffs usually range about the length of an arm or leg, used for blocking, leg sweeps, poking and striking. Ko'oko'o loa, long staff, much like the shorter staff, but can be used from a wider range. Maka pahoa, double-edged eye dagger. This dagger could be used offensively and defensively. As attacking, it can puncture and stab, while defensively, it can be used to block attacks and catch weaponry with the double prongs. Combat training and ideology. Training for lua included spear throwing and catching training and surfing, and the focus on mana or spiritual energy. A similar concept is the aspect of ki, from Chinese or Japanese martial arts. Lua was considered the Hawaiian art of bone breaking, used without weapons. According to some accounts, the art had more than 300 techniques on how to break bones and dislocate joints without the use of weapons. There are some stories about how certain practitioners were so skilled that they could strike nerve centers in their opponent's body to render the affected limb or limbs useless. The fighter would then start from the tips of the fingers on the opponent's hand and work his way up their arm, dislocating joints and breaking bones. Once done, the opponent was left to die from the internal wounds. On a reverse method, a practitioners could reverse the damage that they caused by massaging pressure points and joint adjustment, which is similar to chiropractic care of modern Western medicine. Though aspects of joint pressure, massaging, and joint lock striking is found in Chinese martial arts and Chinese medicine, the Hawaiian islands were isolated from Asia and the Hawaiians seemingly developed these arts on their own without foreign influence. In certain forms of lua that have survived, an emphasis shows how to use the hands, elbows, arms, and legs, knees, and foot movements along with various techniques involving them have been used in the overall concept of lua. Because each joint and bone are naturally connected, these methods overall connect and can display a variation in the overall art of lua techniques. From what information survives, ancient Hawaiian combat units were comprised of groups and small squads, units, and divisions. The said squads and units were broken down into groups of anywhere from 10, 20, and 30 warriors each. 
A full division consisted of a total of 40 warriors. Each squad of 10 men were experts in several types of weaponry that they brought with them into combat. Some of the Lua weaponry used for combat as mentioned are the Ma'a, sling, is used to throw the Bohaku, stone, high into the air and rain down on top of the enemy, followed by Polu, which were long spears. According to some references, multiple stones and slings were used to maximize the effect of raining down on the enemy or opposing forces. As the Lua weapons would fire upon the opponents and cause confusion and chaos upon the enemies, the main forces would advance to encircle the enemy. When the circle was completed, the full division would use close quarter weaponry on their opponents such as staff weapons, strangling cord, the lei, bahoa, single or double-edged daggers, and clubs to finish off and either conquer or kill their enemies. If a Hawaiian warrior lost his weaponry during the course of the battle, he would then rely on the joint locking and breaking techniques. He would also resort to hand-to-hand -hand combat called kui kui, boxing. 